I think it's about time we were honest with ourselves and said, why are we teaching empirical fallacies as the foundation of what is supposed to be an empirical discipline? So we're going to have to strongly disagree on that one, Peter. And I really think I'd like you to look at uh, Alan Blinder's book. Uh, one of the things I find ridiculous is how economists don't read their own literature when it criticizes what they themselves believe. Now, Alan Blinder's book, Asking About Prices, is published in the late 90s. It's been around for, is obvious, for 20-something years. It's about the same generation as Maskell's textbook. If you take a look on Amazon, you'll find Maskell's book has hundreds of reviews, hundreds. You'll find Blinder's book has one review. And I wrote that review. In other words, what doesn't fit the, the ideology is ignored. And that is a travesty of economics. And it's time it stopped. And that's one reason I wrote um, uh, the, new, the new economics. We simply have to abandon fallacies, which have been the foundation of this discipline for the last 130 years. In terms of saying, you know, we want a simple thing for our students, I think economics Economics is too simple. I'll give you a little joke here. My, my, my wife has no interest in the work that I do, uh, but I found out early on that she actually, when she got first got married, it was when she was actually studying an economics degree. And I asked her, why did you choose economics? Her answer was, because it was easy. And if you want to pass an exam in microeconomics, it's just, you know, where, where do the lines intersect and what other lines do you have to add and so on to answer it? It's too simplistic. If you see what engineers do in first year, it trivializes what economists do. And I think it's just to our detriment. Engineers use things like system dynamics. Uh, when the package is called Simulink in particular, which is, this is, this, I mean, Minsky is a, is, a, is a relative of that. They're using differential equations. They've got dynamics going on. We should be modeling the economy the way it is, not with static time slots like supply and demand curves and ISLM. So we completely disagree on that front. So let me end by saying that Steve's manifesto really helps to stimulate a deba debate which is needed. Um, here, by the way, this is Luther, uh, to which uh, uh, Steve explicitly refers in, in, in the movie. Uh, but I think one should be careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, bath Thank you very much. Yeah, first of all, Hicks, Hicks derived ISLM from the classical uh, loanable funds model. It was definitely flawed because you can never derive ISLM from the loanable funds model because the loanable funds model has only one asset, one general purpose good. ISLM has money, has bonds, has central bank reserves and everything. So Hicks made a huge mistake deriving ISLM yeah. from IS, but nevertheless, the model uh, that he probably falsely derived is a very useful model. And I can use it to explain many, many things that are going on. I cannot imagine with your model how you can say anything about what's happening in COVID and what the central banks did and what the what fiscal policy did. Can you explain anything about this with your, with your model? It's quite straightforward. In fact, I can actually one thing I was going to cover is the fact that I can show a jubilee is non-inflationary uh, by by no, a that's, model of that's 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 to the point. What with your model? What can you say about COVID? About the shocks of COVID, how central banks reacted, and how fiscal policy reacted. That's why I need a model for it, to explain my students enormous amount because it, it did that and that that I do in extensive models because what you're looking at, what you've looked at with Minsky so far, is just a model of a, a single uh, the banking sector view alone. But the whole thing has been designed for interlocking uh, what we call godly tables. So this is the banking sector, but I'm showing there is the, the central bank, the government, the treasury fundamentally, and the public, which we can now show separately on on separate screens to show the, how all the all the accounts interrelate. And I can show the impact of central bank purchasing of, of government bonds, for example, as part of the model very easily. It took me about less than a day to build the model you're looking at here. And what I show is the impact of a jubilee um, and, and different ways the jubilee can be managed as both a non-inflationary. And I, I think this is far richer than ISLM. And Peter, it sounds to me like you haven't read Hicks's uh, paper, I ISLM read Explanation. It, I can even show you how he broadly derived it but nevertheless well, still, please please, please let's, let's let's yeah I, I know what he wrote but he made the yeah. mistake of of deriving some ISLM from from the loanable funds model which is absolutely impossible but nevertheless the model he created this way is very useful but please show me how you can see anything meaningful about what's going on in the pandemic with your approach. There are the students sitting in your classroom. Yeah, it's a straight... You know, if you tell yeah, I can, I can tell them if I model... If, if you, what we have happening in the pandemic is an enormous fiscal stimulus where the government is creating money and put it in people's oh, deposit yeah. accounts and that is causing increase in the reserves at the same time. Oh. And that is yeah, that is where what's called the huge increase in savings has come from. It turns up on the model. It's extremely simple to all the 
illustrate them is actually far simpler than yeah, removing a couple of ISLM diagram elements. ISLM, so I'm, ISLM. I'm sorry, I disagree with you. I'm obviously more familiar with my software than you are, and I'm telling you, it's easy for me to model what's happened with the pandemic in, in Minsky, and it makes far more sense than doing it in ISLM, which would show a crowding out effect, which we haven't seen. What we've had are supply chain disruptions. You can, can, can do many things with this, but, but still, I don't see with all of the, with your whole approach to make a simple explanation to the students in the classroom, what's happened? There was a demand shock, and then we had fiscal policy reacting, we had monetary policy reacting. And all this I can nicely explain uh, with ISLM. And, and how can, can you explain it? I think it obscures with ISLM, and that's why I'm, well, I've done my whole work is so we have to get rid of it. And I, you know, I end with Hicks's statement there. I mean, you, you're saying Hicks didn't know what he's talking about. I believe he did. And the final line he says in, in the uh, in the oh, this is the final paragraph. When one turns to questions of policy, looking towards the future instead of the past, the use of equilibrium methods is still more suspect. One cannot prescribe policy without considering the possibility that policy may be changed, which is an, an anticipating Lucas's critique. He then says, I accordingly uh, can go. Uh, it's actually early in the paper he says this, that it's only useful where equilibrium is uh, not a, a total distortion. And he said it should just be no, no more than a classroom gadget to be superseded later on by something better. I think we should take Hicks's advice from 30 years ago and get rid of it and put something which is dynamic in there rather than the static equilibrium thinking if, if, if that you, is fundamental to ISLM. We're going to always disagree on that. You could show me easily... What's happened in the pandemic with your approach? You can yes, I can. You can only so don't expect answer. me to do it in the middle of a discussion. Give me give me more than five minutes to put it together. But Continue. Peter, can't you accept that just to to base it on loanable funds is deeply, deeply flawed and deeply anti-Keynesian? That's what I exactly, present exactly. about. But the ISLM model is not loanable funds. That's the key point. It has nothing to do with loanable funds. In the ISLM model, you have banks that can create money. <laughs> without relying on deposits. Loanable funds is that banks need deposits before they can lend. That's the, and, 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 it's, and loanable funds is a one, one commodity world. Yeah? And, and the difference is in, in, in ISLM, the LM curve are banks that can create money without, without the deposits. That's, what the that's, financial, that's, that's it. The financial system can... But they, can't create, think, they can't create money unless there are borrowers. No, they can't essential, do that. of course, that's, but that's a completely different story. But an essential part of ISLM that's, is deriving it from a constant money supply, which the government can vary, which is a but fiction. You can, you, can, you can adjust ISLM. You can have a, can have a, can have a horizontal M curve. You can do anything. Well, Peter, you and I are going to take a totally different approach to economics in the future, and that's partly why I call this the new economics. The final that. test must be that you can explain in a simple, relatively simple way what's going on in reality. I think that's what matter. And of and course, if you make assumptions uh, which are which are not realistic, it's a problem. But overall, what what counts in the end? Can you explain somehow what's going on? And I must take in with your approach. I don't really see how how one can somehow explain what's going on in reality. I, I don't see. I it. think I, I want I want to have something which engin understand the students engineer as engineering students come out at the end of first year and understand dynamics of systems, non equilibrium behavior, and 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 the actual dynamics of the real world. And economic students come out with a mythical view of a system of moving lines on a flat by blackboard. And I think that's why we've got simpletons in economics rather than geniuses. So I'm sorry, I disagree with you fundamentally. Okay. I think we have that's, to break away from that. And that's I, I what I've written this book. Yeah, I, Thank I you. think yeah, the point is made and, and uh, we will don't we won't solve the this uh, issue now. But it's I think it's very important to to continue to discuss mm -hmm. that. What I would like to ask uh, Steve, I mean you're very skeptical and reading your book, it's uh, it's a very straightforward uh, point against um, mainstream and and neoclassical and, and anything. And it, when you quote Nordhaus, for example, it seems so evident. I mean it's so crazy. Um, mm, it still, is crazy. What would you say? Isn't there something moving in in the domain in in economics? I mean, I mean, if, if you confront today's economists with these things, they wouldn't agree. Uh, so, what can you tell us? What is your view on this? Is there something going on? Is there something, even if not, it, not everyone it, it, agrees it, it, to your models? But um, well, economics, I think, is a dead end, and it's going to stay a dead end while we continue building on foundations like microeconomics and, frankly, ISLM. Um, this is why I said we need a paradigm. A revolution, uh, which we, which economics has managed to prevent, because we come back and forth 
fall back into these old micro grounds whenever the macro lets us down. Show me an ISLM model that predicted the financial crisis. I'd be fascinated to see that. Show me a DSG model that did that. That'd be all equally fascinating. None of them did. And with people like Anne and myself are coming with all alternative analysis and saying, we saw the crisis coming. Your models didn't do it. Why the hell are you still defending them? And this is the problem. You can always get stuck in a rut. And if you want to get out of the rut, you've got to be kicked out of it, frankly. And that's what I'm trying to do by bringing engineering ideas into economics. Uh, so I, I think what's happening... Yes, 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 yes. But in answer to what Thomas has said, I think it is true that economics is moving, that economic students are asking questions and that there are new generations uh, um, rising who are looking at this in a different way. And it is true, for example, here in Britain, our Prime Minister Theresa May assured us that there was no such thing as a magic money tree. And then the mm. next uh, Chancellor, uh, Shunak, uh, announced for the pandemic that there was a magic money tree, that it was possible uh, to finance, if you like, the almost nationalization of the economy. Um, and, you know, these are these are dramatic. These have been dramatic changes um, throughout the pandemic that must be changing minds. Now, of course, the ideology keeps coming back uh, right now. Our government is saying, no, we've got to pay for this and we need austerity. And so we're about to be plunged back into recession here. But for a whole year, it wasn't possible to argue that there isn't a magic money tree. You know, it was clear that the central bank was supporting the government in providing the finance, which was going to uh, to maintain businesses and keep keep the economy on a life support system at the very mom moment when it collapsed through no fault of its own. So, yeah. so you know, I think that must be Thomas a change in minds. But the ideology is still very deep, and we don't see it coming through yeah. in the form of policy. The methods are very deep as well. On the, on the question of forecasting the financial crisis. You said ISLM did not forecast the financial crisis. This is true. But Steve, I looked at the two quotes that you made where you said you did forecast the crisis. One is a paper from 2006 where you forecast the financial crisis for Australia, but the financial Australia didn't have a financial crisis. And the second paper that you mentioned is from September 2007, and the other financial crisis was already there. So I would be a little bit careful in making... Yes, I'm sure, Peter, and I've had this many, many times, and it annoys the hell out of me. So I'm going to talk over the top of you and tell you when I started talking about that. It began on December 18, 2006. I have a conversation that has happened with my wife at the time when I was asked to do an expert witness case over predatory lending in Australia. And as part of that, yeah. I made a throwaway line as an expert witness based on Missy's financial instability hypothesis, saying levels of private debt have been rising exponentially compared to income. Now, I knew as an expert witness in the Australian legal system, I couldn't make a hyperbolic statement. So I thought I had to go and check the data and I'd find that I had to remove the word exponential because it surely wouldn't have been that. And it, I managed, I did a whole lot of routines in my favourite programme, MathCat at the time, so it took me a few hours to get there. Can I finish, please? Can I finish? You've asked me a question here, a challenge to my integrity. I'm going to reply to you on that basis. And I did it, and I found that when I, I got the shock of my life when I plotted the debt to GDP ratio for Australia, and it was clearly exponential. In fact, the correlation between it, the pure exponential function and the ratio of private debt to GDP from 64 to 2007, or 2005, pardon me, was 0.9912. Doesn't get much closer. I didn't remove the word, but I thought, I've got to check the American data. So I managed to get the data from the American Federal Reserve, download that, compare it to GDP, and I got a correlation coefficient for them for 0.97 from 1952 until 2007. So my wife woke up in the morning and said, there's going to be a financial crisis, global. And I then tried to measure alarm about it. There wasn't time to go through journals. So I did it through the newspapers and I mainly stuck with Australia. Now, the reason Australia didn't have a financial crisis is because it stopped the credit collapsing. And the reason it stopped credit collapsing is because I scared the shit out of the government at the time, the government of Kevin Rudd. And there were two consecutive days of the national broadcaster in Australia where they interviewed me one day and Kevin Rudd the next. Now, normally in that show, you get, if you're not the prime minister, you get what well, you get four or five minutes if you're lucky. I got 15. The next day, the prime minister is being inter interrogated about my views. And the day after, the week after that, they came up with a stimulus program doubling and trebling the growth grant for first home buyers to keep the first home, but the house, housing bubble going. So if you look at the credit, which is what Anne and I both know causes financial crises when it goes 
negative. In Australia's case, it didn't go negative. And it was because of stimulus that I scared them into doing. And I criticised at the time. Okay, and That's then, why Australia didn't have a financial crisis. And then China came to the rescue of Australia. China. Yeah, okay. China yeah, so you, anyhow, anyhow, you, but, but anyhow, you give two quotes. The one quote is on Australia, where there was no financial crisis in the end. And the second quote is from September 2007, when the crisis had already been there. It's not you right think I wrote that in September no 2007, Peter? Do you, do, you, do you know nothing about publication lags? I wrote that in, in July. It took until it been, it was September to be published. Now, please, stop giving me rubbish here. I get enough of that from journalists and politicians in Australia. I will not accept it from somebody who calls well, themselves an academic. If you want to look at my, I have blog quotes going back. You can find I talked about Australia because that was my country, okay? I'm nationalist enough to worry about my own country and talk about that. But I made comments about America as well. And you can find debt watch reports going back to 2006 where I talk about the American situation as well. Now, okay. pardon me, but you're being far more of a politician than I'm willing to be by making the sort of claims you're making there. I'm not going to tolerate them. Oh, there are the questions. Exactly. Oh, by the way, uh, Mark, I'm going to say Mark Kirsten, yeah. the question he's made a very good question about what's called ergodicity economic. It's extremely important. It's an alternative to the rational expectations, efficient markets hypothesis nonsense that dominates finance and economics. And I recommend to anybody who doesn't know about ergodic economics to take a look at the work being done by Mark and by Peter, uh, by Ole Peters about an alternative approach to finance, which is far more realistic than the nonsense neoclassicals you know, regurgitate in the efficient markets hypothesis. Okay. Um, I, I would, um, I, I mean, uh, at some point I was afraid that this will be too much of a harm harmony discussion. Um, I'm convinced <laughs> now that uh, this was a wrong assumption. Um, but still, I, I would come back to, to the point, what is moving and, and how. What is your view of a paradigm shift and a paradigm, a new paradigm? Um, I mean, is that the big revolution that will come at some point? Or is there something about, you know, moving from time to time? If you look at former paradigm shifts inside the, the, the one you, you may consider as, as one, but after the Second World War and the new, new, new liberal paradigm shift, this has never come by one revolution at one day, but a, a lot of movements going going around. So are there things that we would consider as positive and where you can... Well, yes, for example, the work of the Ole Peters and what he calls the economics, I see that as a very significant paradigm shift that completely inverts the whole efficient markets hypothesis and the idea effectively you can... You, the, the idea that what you do is... Is given by expected expected uh, value and expected utility. That's a, that's a true paradigm shift from the finance side. Complex systems. This is another one coming into economics. And what I what I do with my work on Minsky is fundamentally showing that complex systems gives you a totally different outcome to economics. And your foundation is macroeconomics, not micro. In fact, I think micro should be as it's taught should be thrown away. It's a waste of time. Uh, all those the so called lessons are lessons about a world that doesn't exist. As Bedlin said many many decades ago, we have a taxonomy of perfect competition, imperfect the competition, monopoly and oligopoly, where you cannot find a single instance of that in the real world. Okay, We have, a, we have a, a taxonomical economics, which is not relevant to the actual real world. We need an evolutionary one. And back again, Jim Schumpeter was very good on that. We need an evolutionary theory of competition, not the static, the uh, a taxonomic one, which we haven't criticised so effectively. Mm. But then, in other words, there is there is there is no revolution within neoclassical economics. There are changes of paradigm. There are shifts in what the Lakatos used to call the protective belt assumptions around the hard core. But the hard core of utility maximising behaviour, subjective valuation, everything in the real rather than the, the nominal nominal the monetary world, that is untouchable and unchanged. And so long as it stays there, we will never have a decent economics. Uh, Peter, uh, perhaps just a, a question on money matters. Is that something that goes? I mean, that more and more economists would uh, accept as an idea in in Germany? Well, I think uh, what one can see is that in in the prestigious U.S. universities in Harvard and Princeton and so on, uh, what what are uh, macroeconomics are still macroeconomics without money. So they are still totally based on the loadable funds approach. There are still no banks that can create money independently. And I think here, a real revolution is, is definitely needed. Uh, so I think that's, that's absolutely so. Also, the financial crisis has shown that this loadable funds paradigm is completely obsolete. It still is a dominant model in, in all, all uh, top mainstream uh, papers and, and, and approaches. I think here, here we definitely need, need a revolution. Okay. No Thank you very okay. much. Thank, Thank you. Bye, Peter. Fascinating Bye -bye. discussion. Cheers. Bye.